Good morning and welcome to an online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today you will be hearing about the latest developments in Parkinson's disease research from Dr. Jeff Bronstein. Today's Let's Talk Parkinson's program is brought to you by our generous sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kieran, Medtronic, and Supernus and by donations from the Parkinson's community from people just like you. If you appreciate what we do, please consider making a donation on our website at pcla.org. It'd be so appreciated and thank you in advance. Please join me today in welcoming our speaker. Dr. Jeff Bronstein received his MD and PhD from UCLA as a recipient of the Medical Scientist Training Program Award. He completed a residency in neurology and fellowship training in movement disorders at UCLA and a postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology before being appointed as an assistant professor of neurology. Dr. Bronstein was later appointed director of the movement disorders program at UCLA. His interests and expertise include the management of Parkinson's and other movement disorders, surgical treatments of PD, and developing new therapies for patients. Dr. Bronstein's laboratory study in the cause of PD using cell models and a newly developed zebrafish model. His work is supported by the NIH and private foundations. Dr. Bronstein also directs clinical trials in order to develop new therapies for PD that include transplantation and deep brain stimulation. He has received several awards and is widely published in the field. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Bronstein, and welcome. Uh, th thanks, Patrick, It's uh, and thank uh, Judy and Vivian and everybody for inviting me. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here and talk about the latest in the research, which is uh, what my passion is, and as well as taking care of patients. I want to thank you and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the research and what's going on, because there's lots of gains that are being made. And I always like to start a little bit with the, the science behind it so you understand the approaches uh, that we're taking in finding basically cures for Parkinson's, not only treating the symptoms, but diagnosing patients and slowing the progression down. I would like to start and say I have no conflicts of interest. I don't take money from any uh, in industry. So everything I say is my opinion and not from not influence hopefully i want to start with what causes parkinson's and uh it's a complicated answer so we'll start uh with kind of the basics 101. um this is uh a brain this is the midbrain if you look up here it's kind of right in the mid right up there it's a little tiny spot in kind of the middle of your brain and there's an area called the substantia nigra for obvious reasons it's black this is not stained. Um, and these are where the dopamine cells lie in Parkinson's. And in a Parkinson's patients, after they passed away, you could see a lot of that black went away. And so this was the earliest findings in the early 1900s. We saw that that was where some of the cell loss was. When you look at a microscope and you do kind of normal staining, you can see these they're called Lewy bodies, and there's the, these aren't supposed to be here. This is an accumulation of proteins. Uh, up until about 20 years ago, we had no idea what was in this, but we knew it was abnormal and it was always associated with Parkinson's disease. This stuff right around here, that's actually the pigment. That's normal. That's what identifies it as a uh, dopamine neuron, and that's what makes the substantia nigra black. Um, so we found a um, uh, couple decades ago that this Lewy body was chock full of a protein called alpha-synuclein. And you're going to hear a lot about alpha-synuclein because we think it's central to Parkinson's disease. Um, this is an immune um, stain that, um, that shows that now this is dark brown, that's staining for alpha-synuclein, and it's just chock full of alpha-synuclein. And we know that this is important because this was first found in a genetic form of Parkinson's where the gene uh, that codes for alpha-synuclein was mutated. If you make more of that normal alpha-synuclein, you get Parkinson's disease. And if you overexpress it, if you make more of it in an animal, they get what looks like a lot like Parkinson's. So we have lots of evidence to support that alpha-synuclein is central to PD. 
So if we look more at a molecular level, there's a cartoon here you can see. And um, you can see that normally alpha synuclein, if you can see my pointer isn't working very well. Um, here on the left, it, normally alpha synuclein likes to be unfolded, loosely attached to membranes, and it's very happy. But every now and then it will misfold. And when it misfolds, that tends to make it clump together. And when it clumps together, you form what we call oligomers, which means just lots of molecules stuck together. And when they've been stuck together for a, a bit of time, they can actually form what we call fibrils. And these fibrils are really what Lewy bodies are made of, a lot of the fibrils. A lot of discussion in the field of what's toxic, the fibrils or the oligomers. And in this picture, it's the oligomers. And there's lots of different types of oligomers. But it's important to say that these are both pathological. They're not, they're not supposed to be this way, at least certain types of oligomers and the fibrils. So when we start looking in brains, now we can identify where Parkinson's uh, pathology is because we know what protein to look for. We can get very sensitive markers called antibodies um, that we use to stain for it. So in this bottom left, you can see all these little sections here. And what you see the brown is are in patients that had biopsies of their colon five years before they ever got uh, came down with the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's. And they, after they got Parkinson's, they went back and stained it for alpha synuclein, and they all had synuclein in their gut. This was years before their disease started. There's a very famous neuropathologist, uh, Dr. Brock, who looked at hundreds of brains and stained for synuclein and found that it was found in the earliest, either down in the brain stem or in what's called the olfactory bulb, these areas that are black. And then as time went on, it would see it spread into other areas. So there seemed to be, in general, a very um, stereotyped or very predictable type of spread through the nervous system and, uh, and progression. Uh, it's not 100%, it's about 80% of cases are like that, but in general, it seems to work that way. Some of this was confirmed with a really uh, very cool study done in Denmark and also was re uh, reproduced in, in uh, Sweden as well, where like many, many years ago, decades ago, when people had ulcers, they would actually cut the connection between the gut and the brain. And that nerve is called the vagus nerve and they do a vagotomy and that would cut all the extra acid going into the stomach well, it turned out, if you look, people that had that nerve cut uh, had a half the chance of getting Parkinson's disease. So that was evidence, one of many pieces of evidence suggesting that maybe it starts in the gut, travels through the vagus nerve, gets into the brain that way, and then progresses. So the current theory uh, that most people believe, not everybody, but most people believe, is that we have this normal alpha synuclein floating around, but when it comes into contact with a misfolded alpha synuclein, that turns the normal one into a misfolded one. And then all the misfolded ones tend to clump. And then it can go to the next cell, it gets released, taken up by the next cell, and then it can start turning the normal ones into abnormal ones as well. And this, this spreads very slowly throughout the, the whole nervous system. This concept, it's called templating or seeding, was actually discovered over 20 years ago by um, this guy, Stan Prusner up at UCSF, who won the Nobel Prize for this, uh, for a similar or different disease called prion disease. Um, but the concepts appear to be the same. It's just much slower in Parkinson's. So as you can see in this bottom um, cartoon, we think it starts in the gut, travels up the vagus nerve, gets into the lower brain stem, and then moves to the midbrain, and then uh, can spread up into uh, the cortex. It may also start in the olfactory bulb, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And there's a little controversy whether there's two different places where it may start, 
or it may spread from one to the other, uh, maybe both. Now, the symptoms really um, are caused by the pathology um, in the part of the nervous system where you see it. So, for example, the very first symptom we think, or one of the first symptoms, is constipation. And this has been recorded over a decade before anybody's even diagnosed with Parkinson's. And that's because, as I showed, um, there's pathology in the gut very, very early on. Um, same thing with the olfactory system. People lose the sense of smell or can't smell quite as well. So that's because it's very early found the pathology synuclein in um, the olfactory bulb, which is right around here. Now, depression, anxiety, sleep disorders actually precede the diagnosis quite often as well. And that can be attributed to an area called the locus surrealis right around here. It's just south of the substantia nigra. They contain a lot of serotonergic nerves, nerves that make serotonin. And it's only till you get to the substantia nigra where a lot of dopamine is being made do you make the diagnosis because that's when the tremor starts. That's when the stiffness and the slowness and the walking starts. So it's moving up from the vagus nerve connects right about here, right in the brainstem. And then it's moving up north. And then over many, many years and decades, it sometimes can actually spread to the cortex. And that's when people can start having some memory problems, hallucinations and things like that. So that, again, this is not universal. It's a very slow process, um, uh, but it's very helpful for us to understand uh, the progression of the disease. Here's another way to look at it. So um, if you go two decades uh, before the diagnosis time zero, right in the middle. So if you go two decades before, you start seeing problems with constipation, in this case, bladder dysfunction, uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, smelling, and it's called hip osmia and sleep disorders and again only till you get tremor and stiffness do we make the diagnosis because not everybody who has constipation or has problems sleeping or depressed is going to get parkinson's but some of them will and then later on it can progress and again it's very variable everybody's different uh, but there's this generality of this progression um, as laid out here okay so a critical question is what starts this process? How does it get going? And the simple answer to that is uh, uh, the environment we think is a trigger, uh, but it has to be on a fertile genetic ground. So not everybody who's exposed to certain environmental toxins or, uh, or uh, negative environmental things like head trauma are gonna get Parkinson's, only some will, and a lot of the determinants are going to depend on a genetic background. So it's this gene environment interaction, which is the key. And some people are going to get a big dose of uh, genetic risk, and other people are going to get a big dose of environmental risk, and some are going to have a mixture of them. Um, and so everybody's cause of Parkinson's is going to be a little bit different. So we think that the cumulative genetic risk is about 30%. And this doesn't mean that it runs in families 30% of the time. What it means is that we have variations in our normal genes that um, can be slightly tilt you to getting more likely to get Parkinson's. So for example, if like myself, Nobody in my family has Parkinson's. I have a 1% lifetime risk of getting Parkinson's. If I have certain variations in normal genes, they're not mutations, they're just variations that are common, I might have 1.2%. And so there's about 20 of these different variants that have been found that affect very small amount, but it's, it, it all adds up. And then about 5% actually run in families. And I'll cover that a little bit in the next slide. Um, the fact that the pathology starts in the olfactory bulb and in the gut really tells me that the environment plays a big part, right? Because that's how our body interacts with the environment. We either eat stuff 
or we inhale it. And those are our major routes of, uh, of um, interacting um, with uh, toxins in the environment. So that's a clue in my mind. So this is the short list of genes that can cause Parkinson's. So these are mutations. These are not those variations I was talking about. These are mutations. And we think about 5% of all cases fall in this category. A little bit more common in, in people that when they get it younger, but by no means um, uh, young onset is always genetic. It's a little bit higher risk. Some of them, it's we call dominant, where you only need one bad gene. Others recessive, where you need two bad genes to actually get the disease. It's also further complicated by the fact that there's a thing called penetrance. So a mutation, say in LERC2, which is the most common um, mutation, it tends to run in Ashkenazi Jewish families. It's a dominant, so that if you get one of the mutations, you're at a higher risk, but only maybe one in, uh, may only half the people or even a quarter of the people that have the mutation will eventually come down with Parkinson's. So it's very complicated, the genetics, because you have dominant, recessive, and then you have uh, reduced penetrance, which makes it even uh, uh, more variable. But we think about 5% of, of all Parkinson's are uh, caused by one of these genes in this, in this thing. So many genes to cause a small slice of Parkinson's disease. Now, they've been very, very helpful in trying to understand uh, what are the molecular pathways that lead to Parkinson's? Why does synuclein clump up um, uh, uh, when you mutate these? So they've really been instrumental in giving us clues. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So what are the environmental causes? So we know a lot of things other than genes um, influence risk. So the older you are, the higher the risk. Even though early 60s is the peak, your risk still goes up as you get older. Uh, men get it almost twice as much as females for reasons we have no idea. But in every study, that's the case. About 1.7 is the risk, or almost two. People who smoke cigarettes, drink alcohol, or drink a lot of coffee actually have a lower risk of getting Parkinson's. Now, many of us think that these aren't protective, so I'm not going to tell you go out and start smoking. We think it has to do with addictive behavior. Um, people are losing dopamine decades before they actually uh, uh, are, are diagnosed with Parkinson's. And when your dopamine's lower, it's a lot easier to quit these um, addictive behaviors. So we people really find it easy to quit smoking um, a decade before they get Parkinson's disease. We, Dr. Ritz has done these studies, so it's pretty clear that, that that's playing a role. Uh, so I don't think you should smoke or drink a lot of alcohol, um, but you can drink coffee because you need that, or at least I do. Um, but um, they're not, I don't think they're protective. But again, the association is really there. Uh, head trauma increases your risk um, and can be mild head trauma. So you don't want to hit your head a lot. Um, exercise repeated, you know, regularly reduces your risk of getting Parkinson's. Um, diets are really important. It turns out that people that are on a Mediterranean diet or something close to that have half the risk of getting Parkinson's disease. It's quite, quite astounding, actually, the size of the effect. Um, then there's the toxins, which you've heard a lot about in the press, if you read about things like pesticides. This is something that um, we've studied at UCLA, all of these risk factors in genetics. Pesticides is, a, is a one that we study a lot, identifying which ones. But there are a major risk factor, especially in the Central Valley, where there's a lot of farming and they're sprayed everywhere. Um, you know, just remember some pesticides are good, but you really want to minimize the exposure. Uh, air pollution turns out to be a, a significant risk factor. Um, so many people are exposed to it, uh, so it doesn't have to increase your risk that much to have a huge effect. 
And then one of the more recent ones that's been identified are solvents, uh, trichloroethylene or TCE. So if you heard the Camp Lejeune uh, article uh, uh, ads on TV and everything, in, in this base, um, military base called Camp Lejeune, it turns out that there were very high levels of TCE in the water there for decades. And the risk of getting Parkinson's as well as other cancers and things is, is dramatically higher. It's a very, it's as tight of a case for environmental risk as you're gonna find because they measured it for many years and they have really good histories on everybody that worked on the, on the base and lived there. So a lot of things in the environment, we're still looking for more. There's gonna be many things that are gonna to contribute to the risk. So they're not by themselves necessarily cause it, but they add risk. So we've learned a lot about what these mutations do. We've learned about some of these toxins do. And this is a kind of a summary that cartoon that I've come up with, which kind of summarizes it because this is how we attack um, uh, the disease process. Uh, if we understand how it, what happens on a molecular basis, we can target that for treatment. So you can see I put aggregation of synuclein in the center here. We have things that um, processes that break down synuclein. So that would be good if we make less of it. It's going to make less of these clumps. We also know free radicals or oxidative stress is bad, and that's due to mitochondria being injured. And we think in some people that may be leading to the accumulation of alpha synuclein. And then there's some inflammation that may play a role. So I want you to remember this picture because I'm going to talk about some of the strategies and treatments on trying to, say, get rid of alpha synuclein through say antibodies, immune mechanisms, there's anti-inflammatory me uh, medicines that are being tested. There are medicines that boost up our degradation. Um, there are approaches to make less synuclein. So there are a lot of strategies that, are, uh, um, that can be mapped out in this cartoon. Okay, so now talking about some of the new research. So a few months ago, you may have heard, especially through the Fox Foundation, they're very big in promoting this finding, which was a new test for who has Parkinson's. And so um, it goes right directly to um, uh, what I was talking about, alpha-synuclein clumping. So when alpha-synuclein form fibrils, if you put a chemical in there called thioflavin, it fluoresces. So if we take alpha synuclein and we put a little bit of an oligomer, a little bit of misfolded, uh, it goes shooting way up. And that's called a seed assay, alpha synuclein seed amplification assay. So it turns out if you take spinal fluid from people with Parkinson's, they all have seeds. And you can distinguish between that and somebody without, not 100%, but pretty close. People that have some of the risk factors, um, say they have REM sleep behavior, acting out their dreams. If you take, uh, take CSF from them and do the seed assay, they can predict with pretty high levels of who's going to get Parkinson's and who's not. So it's incredibly effective. It's not as effective for some of the genetic forms, um, but it's really quite useful. Now, it's not going to be very useful for clinical um, uh, normal day-to-day -day clinical work, but it's really useful for studies because we want to have ways, they're called biomarkers, to be sure we're identifying the right people and that ways to follow them. Um, we also can use um, this assay we use to treatment. One of the experimental treatments we're trying to develop at UCLA called Tweezer CLR01, this is one of our studies from our uh, one of our papers where we show that that blocks this aggregation. So now we can use this assay not only to identify people, but maybe even to identify treatments. Another treatment that came out in the last few years is called the SIN1 uh, skin biopsy. So you can actually, your doctor now can take a small skin biopsy, it's done in the office, and then you stain for alpha synuclein, which you can see here. And that's very accurate in identifying people that have um, uh, Parkinson's. And there's also a couple other disorders that have problems with alpha synuclein. And this would be positive as well for that. So it doesn't distinguish 
um, between all diseases, but it will tell you that alpha synuclein pathology is underlying your problems. So that can be very useful, again, in studies uh, in particular. Um, okay, so these are, I'll show you, this is just a couple pages of the list of things that are in, in trials or have recently been tried. So some of them are small molecules like the clr one that I talked about that's made to break up alpha-synuclein. Um, there's one of these um, that's really quite exciting. It's still in just finishing phase one, which means they're going into phase two soon, um, which means you're going to see if it actually works in people, but it's very, very promising. So this would be like a pill that you would take that hopefully would break up those clumps of alpha-synuclein. There's drugs, um, you've heard of drugs like nilotinib in the past, which was very, uh, uh, there was a, a lot of controversy about it, but they're basically directing um, the the body to help break down synuclein. It induces a thing called autophagy. It's one of the garbage disposals to break it down. And this didn't work so well in, in humans in the early trials, but newer ones are being developed that, that get into the brain better that probably um, will have a better chance of working. Um, the ones that I'm very excited about are, uh, in addition to the small molecules, are the immune-based ones. So these are the ones like in Alzheimer's where you're going to infuse antibodies and to help, and when the antibodies bind to the synuclein, the immune system helps clear that synuclein away. And I'll show, so these have gone through um, phase two testing already. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. But there are also some uh, strategies to actually have your body make your own immune system, make the antibodies. So they basically, it's a vaccine. So they give syn this synuclein-like molecule and your body uh, directs antibodies to attack it. So those are in early trials. The safety trials have been done. It's been a very slow to get to phase two, but I'm not sure why. Um, but the phase ones have been very promising. Then there's strategies. These are some genetic strategies here to make less synuclein. These are called um, antisense oligomers, where they bind to the RNA and prevent you from making synuclein. So if you reduce it a little bit, that may um, slow the disease progression down. Um, and then there's a little bit more targeted ones. Um, this is actually getting to be very interesting. When I talked about LERC2, um, there, what happens in the mutation is it's overactive. It's a, called a kinase, an enzyme. And so there are drugs that actually can cut that down. And that's a, a, so there's been trials now for people that have that mutation to slow the disease progression down. And there's now some evidence that suggests that in people without the LERC2 mutation may have overactive uh, LERC2, and those drugs may actually help in those people. And so that's been really exciting. So this may have much broader implications than just treating people with LERC2. And there's ones also for, for another genetic form um, called GBA or glucocerebrosidase, the Gaucher's gene. There are drugs that are being tested for that. So lots and lots of things to try to slow the progression down. These are uh, results um, uh, from one of, so two antibodies have been tested in detail. This is one of them from Prothena. The Biogen was a failure. Um, and Prothena actually did slow the progression down, um, maybe about 15, 20%, not as much as we had hoped. But it's, it was our first shot. And um, to give some perspective, in Alzheimer's disease, they went through about 10 different antibodies before they found one that seemed to work. And the first one was only about 10 or 20%. The most recent one is down to 60% slowing. So this is early in the development, and we have some advantages and disadvantages uh, relative to uh, Alzheimer's disease in this strategy, but I'm very hopeful that we have the first signs that this may help. So um, this is the Prothena, they're, and they're extending the current study in planning the next one. 
Um, there are several other companies that have antibodies that are going into trials now, uh, some in a more aggressive disease called multiple system atrophy, which has also got a lot of synuclein. Um, so there's an antibody trial just starting for that now. So very hopeful. Um, and the proof for principle in Alzheimer's is there now for sure. So that, that's why I'm excited. Um, there's the drugs that are called the GLP-1 inhibitors. So these are the ones that cause weight loss in people, um, made for diabetes. Um, they've been neuroprotective in uh, some animal trials. And so there's been a number of trials that have been ongoing. And a big one is going to be released in September at a big meeting in Copenhagen. So we'll find out. I was, uh, I was at a meeting in Europe this summer and the guy who knew the answer, well, he said he didn't know it, but I think he did, but he wouldn't tell me. Uh, so we'll find out um, whether this strategy is gonna work. Um, I wouldn't be too uh, anxious to get on this drug until we know because it does keep the stomach from contracting as much. You've heard this in the news maybe recently and people with Parkinson's already have a problem with the stomach contracting. So, um, so these trials are so important to see how safe they are in Parkinson's patients and whether they work. So don't jump on it unless you have diabetes or weight loss. That's really uh, a strong indication. But hopefully, if this works, we can get it into patients right away because they're already FDA approved. Um, this was actually one of the early trials with a drug called exenatide, which is one of these GLP-1 agonists. And you can see the Parkinson's patients actually uh, progress slower. It's a small study and got some design issues, but they've done two of these and it was very suggestive. So we're hopeful that it's going to at least make a dent in Parkinson's. It may not be the, the home run, but it may be a single or a double. Uh, we do have one, an approved therapy. Um, some of you, I apologize if, I, if you've heard this before, but it's so important that you do have an approved therapy and it's called exercise. So these are well-tried studies showing that people that uh, were on a stationary, that with regular stationary bikes, people without it um, progressed quite a bit and people without it didn't progress at all. And then um, if you, this is a different study with high intensity didn't progress, medium intensity progressed a little bit and people that didn't exercise progress more. So there is a treatment out there, you can do it, it's free, um, it'll make you live longer and better anyway because uh, it'll reduce heart disease, it reduces dementia and overall makes you feel better. So. I always got to plug it because it's real and makes a big difference. Uh, diet, same thing, Mediterranean diet or something, vegetarian, stay away from fried foods, red meat, a lot of dairy, um, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, nuts, things like that really make a difference. Uh, and a good night's sleep is essential. So all of those things are the basics. You have control over it. And um, uh so no no uh, no reason not to do it all right so now those are treatments to slow the disease down what's happening in treating the symptoms for those of you already have it so i think the biggest thing that you're going to the biggest change are for people that have a lot of motor fluctuations ups and downs you know where you take the medicine and then you get the extra movements and then it wears off after a couple hours and you're stuck and you got to pop your cinemed every couple hours. Um, it's a real roller coaster. So we always we already have a thing called Duopa where you put the tube in the stomach but and then pump it in. A lot of people don't like the pump, putting a hole in their stomach, and I don't blame them. And so it hasn't really taken off, but it works really well. So a couple companies have come up with a way to put the pump and it goes through your skin and it's a smaller pump. Um, we work with AbbVie and did the trials with that. There's another company called Neuroderm. Um, AbbVie's already submitted for approval, so we're hopeful it's going to happen any time now. It's been very, very uh, effective and really smoothing things out. 
because these are people that often go to deep brain stimulation, but some people either aren't good candidates because of other medical reasons, or they don't want to have brain surgery, and this would be an alternative. Um, there's progress being made on improving deep brain stimulation, what's called closed loop, where instead of me programming you, your brain will read the recordings and kind of program itself. Um, that's been studied. Stanford's been a real leader in this. Um, I don't think it's going to be a huge change, but it is uh, definitely uh, has potential. And then stem cell trials are just starting. Um, there are different types of trials uh, that are going on, but there's one that's just starting. Um, and it's going to be for, again, for advanced people that are going up and down. Um, and that's got its promise as well. Again, it's not a cure. It's a symptomatic treatment because it's not going to change the alpha synuclein in your gut, the rest of your brain, and the spread. What it will change uh, are your symptoms. This is just to remind me to talk about the blood levels of levodopa. And so this is actually from Duopa. I don't have a slide showing from the skin one, but it's almost identical to this. So you can get nice stable levels. And that's as opposed to what we do now. You take a pill, it goes up, then it comes down, up. If you take something like a Ritari, it goes up and down a little bit less. Um, but doing continuous infusions can really help and keep people in this sweet spot so that they don't have dyskinesias and off time all day long. So one of the other exciting things for me is all the wonderful new recruitment and new faculty that we have at UCLA that are doing the research. So I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, Dr. Chow Peng is this uh, incredible molecular um, protein biologist who's discovered all these things about alpha-synuclein folding and spread and is just, uh, uh, just a dynamo. Uh, Will Zeiger is a, a clinician as well as a scientist, and he does uh, tries to figure out how synuclein affects cells and the circuits and why people have the symptoms. Uh, Dr. Katie Cross studies freezing of gait, and I think many of you will uh, have problems with that, and so she's trying to understand that, and she's been using deep brain stimulation and working with those patients as well, some other techniques to try to figure that out so we can finally get a treatment. Dr. Kim Paul, she does all these genetic, proteomics, all these big data um, studies and fantastic. That's Kim down here, that's Katie. And then Tim is an, another geneticist and does precision medicine using integrating electronic medical records with genetics. It's uh, way beyond my, uh, my abilities for sure. And then we have Dr. Jennifer Adrisi and Dr. Addis Menzabal, and they're doing health services research. Um, uh, Addis is studying uh, particularly Huntington's disease, and, um, and Jennifer is working with the underserved population and cognitive dysfunction. So I think I've left uh, plenty of time for questions. That was my goal. And I think I'll stop there. And I think Patrick is going to going to uh, moderate this. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Bronstein. This is uh, amazing. We have some really great questions. We've got a lot of them. I want to apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. Um, but let's just start with the cross relations to Alzheimer's and studies done by Dr. Dale Brenderson's and if this treatment could help people with Parkinson's. Oh, it's an interesting question. So Dale Bredesen, actually. So Dale's a friend. I've known him from years, and he's been a faculty, actually, at UCLA twice. Um, so, so Dale uh, studies Alzheimer's disease, and he's come up with what's called the, the Bredesen Protocol. And, you know, he's got a basic theory that there are many components in our general lifestyle that... Um, really affect Alzheimer's disease and that if you do all these different things you can slow the disease or stop it reverse it um, so many of these things are things like making uh, taking vitamin b12 making you sleep uh, and giving melatonin so many of the things are incorporated to what i told you diet uh, making sure you're not vitamin deficient 
getting a good night's sleep. Uh, the problem with Dale's uh, theory is it's never been tested. So, and one of the reasons that he's been uh, really criticized in the scientific community because he's a fantastic scientist. I mean, he's brilliant and his lab did great work, but he came up with this protocol, this book, and has been promoting it now for years, but he's never done a, a study ever. And he just talks about individual patients. Um, so I think there's something to be said for it in the big picture, um, but a lot of it is hype. So I think if you focus on making sure you eat a good diet, make sure you're not deficient in vitamins like B12, make sure you get a good night's sleep and exercise, you're really doing the core of the Bredesen protocol. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, what does exercise do for Parkinson's exactly? What is the mechanism? Is it hormones or neural pathways? Yeah, great question. Lots of theories, nobody knows for sure. So one theory is that it increases the release of growth hormones in the brain. So this is the neurons, especially one called GDNF. Um, and so growth hormone definitely goes up when animals exercise. If that is actually the cause of the neuroprotection or the slowdown, we're not sure, but that's one of the ways that it goes. Another thing is it's cardiovascular health. If, you, if your blood vessels are working better, both the big ones and the small ones, it's more blood to the brain, um, that may be part of it as well. Um, and we know that exercise does those things. But the reality is uh, it's probably multiple things, you know, better control of blood pressure, better control of, um, of, um, uh, of blood sugar, all those things, you know, people who exercise also tend to sleep better. And we actually get rid of those proteins, those clumps more when we sleep. It's through this special system called glymphatic system. So if you exercise, you sleep better. So then that may be helping in that. It also helps GI function. So it helps so many different aspects. So we don't know which thing is actually causing it. Okay. Uh so can you, we have a request for you to talk about red light therapy for Parkinson's red light. Yeah. So, you know, there's, it's been talked about in a couple different uh, contexts. And so I'll talk about it in the one that I think you're referring to. And so um, the guy who invented uh, DBS, this guy, Alem Benabid, um, has really taken on uh, this concept that if you shine certain uh, light at a frequency, the red light frequency, at a certain intensity, you can actually make dopamine cells uh, more resistant to toxins and die less. So this is done in a test tube. So he's actually taken surgically these um, uh, laser red lights, puts it in the brain, shines it on the substantia nigra in animals, and it seems to maybe have some protective therapy. So that's where this came from. That is being extrapolated in, uh, in uh, alternative therapies as shining red lights is going to help you. I think there's absolutely nothing to support uh, red light therapy in, uh, other than some of the sticking a, a, a something in your brain uh, that's going to help. So I think there's nothing to that except uh it's a money-making venture for many of these alternative people interesting you know um there is so much of this kind of information out there uh you know and and now with google and everything else what is a good way for people running into this kind of stuff or finding it or being approached to and, and how do, how can someone differentiate between what is something like this and maybe something is more legitimate? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question because, you know, you're saying information, it's not really information. Most of the stuff out there is just marketing, right? These are not scientists that are making these things. They're, it's all marketing based on hype. Um, the best place, so online, there's the Fox Foundation, uh, there's the NI, uh, NIH, uh there's uh apda 
uh, Parkinson's Foundation all have websites. Many of them have um, discussion groups on this. Fox Foundation is a good one. Because Michael, he would be taking anything, I can tell you, if he thought it might help. And so there's a lot of scientists that's part of that. So that that's a good place to go uh, question. But I'll tell you, and you can ask your, your doctor. I, I mean, believe me, if there's something out there that I think is safe that has any chance, I'm going to bring it up to you. And I think most will, but almost all of these things are untested and both for safety as well as efficacy or whether it does something. So honestly, most of the stuff out there is not real. So I'll give you an example. Stem cells has a great thing in the NIH website about that. Um, but the idea of stem cells are great, right? You can replace those dopamine cells, you know, and that's going to do it. The problem is, is uh, how do you get them there? How do they make the right connections? And so that it knows when and where to release this stuff. So at minimum, you have to at least inject the cells into the brain. If you inject it through the spinal fluid or the blood, it's not going to get there. But you can go out and you can buy those. You can go even in, in the States because your own cells are not regulated. So they can take stuff out of your body and stick it anywhere they want You pay and call it stem cells and charge you $20,000. And people are doing that. Um, so they take a concept that has some basis with stem cells do have a promise, but then they pervert it into a money-making uh, 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 organization. So be wary. People are out there to take your money. You want to take something. You say, I got nothing to lose. You do have something to lose. Besides the money, some of these things are dangerous. Um, and you really want the efforts to be towards finding real treatments and real cures. Great. Thanks for addressing that so com comprehensively. Um, in regards to head trauma, environmental toxins, does your age at the time of trauma slash exposure expect, uh, affect your level of risk, i.e. head trauma at age eight versus trauma at 28? Yeah, really good question. And I wish I could give you a definitive answer. Um, I will say in animals, it does make a difference. Um, older animals are more susceptible to it. Um, but, you know, you know, rats and mice only live two years, so it's hard to do long-term studies on them. So it's really hard to know. Um, how do you measure mild head trauma uh, from when you're eight years old to when you're 50 or 60? You know, I don't remember how much my head was hit. And we think minor head trauma is probably a, a, an issue as well. So it's a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, you know, do the best you can and not get hit in the head. There are actually some genetic things. It's actually a risk factor for Alzheimer's as well. And people with certain genetic backgrounds are actually much more sensitive to head trauma than people um, with a different genetic background. So it's complicated, but age is clearly going to be a variable. And so it, it's a very good question without a good answer. Uh, does glutathione detoxify the brain and thus reduce Parkinson's symptoms? So that's one of those um, uh, therapies out there that is based on some science, but not in practice. So glutathione is something that binds free radicals in all cells, including the nervous system. Um, it's how we protect ourselves. When we take oxygen and turn it into energy, it produces free radicals. That's a normal process. And we have lots of it in our cells to protect against that. When you take glutathione, you cannot increase the concentration in those cells. So you just, there's, it just doesn't work. So it has been tested in Parkinson's. It does not help Parkinson's. It's very safe. We've learned that just like coenzyme Q10 but it doesn't slow the progression down, unfortunately. Uh, are we trying to educate the current gastro doctors that there are reasons to treat things more aggressively? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, so yes, um, we, we actually had 
and where we have one, but she works at the VA. We had one here, actually, a gas, gastro uh, specialist who was specifically interested in Parkinson's. So we've learned a lot. Um, so we are teaching them more. Um, constipation is the biggest problem that we have usually, um, and that's from the disease in general. Um, there's other forms, bacterial overgrowth and things like that, um, that they're getting better at addressing. So yes, we're trying to educate them. Yes, we're trying, to, you're much more likely to get one that's educated at a academic institution like UCLA. Um, there uh, are others out there, um, but it is an unmet need. There are some medicines that are starting to work, like there's one called Prucalipride, uh, which helps stimulate the gut motility. It's one of those new expensive drugs, unfortunately, but for some people that have severe bloating, um, it really can help. Um, so there are approaches that we can do and finding a good GI doc can be difficult. Um, ask your Parkinson specialist. They often will know one that they work with. Great. Uh, the current phase three Parkinson's DMT trials include Buntanatap, a translational inhibitor, and Mamantatine, a MNMDA receptor modulator. Do you have any comments on these? Yeah, so the first one you talked about, that's the antisense, which I mentioned. So that's where you block the expression. So there's a couple different companies. Ionis is kind of the leader in the in the world on that. So that's just make less alpha-synuclein. So those trials, they have to be very careful. They've done a trial in Huntington's disease with that, and they've learned some things that there was some toxicity involved, so they've been modifying it to make sure this approach is safe. Um, so it's still in the early phases of that. Memantine, which is uh, Nemenda, which is on the market already, um, unfortunately does not seem to slow the progression down. Um, it's been tested in many diseases. So there's one of the transmitters, dopamine's a transmitter, you know, how the chemicals talk to each other, serotonin's one, glutamate is another one. And if you have too much glutamate, um, uh, it binds to different glutamate receptors and NMDA receptors are one of those and it can kill cells. Unfortunately, blocking them does not seem uh, to help in Parkinson's from them dying, but they may help dyskinesia. So amantadine blocks NMDA to some degree and that actually uh, reduces uh, dyskinesia. So it may have a role to, um, uh, uh, for uh, treating the dyskinesias blocking NMDA. And I've had some patients on high doses of memantine, the 28 milligrams, actually have had a little less dyskinesias. It's used for memory is right now what the indication is. But unfortunately, didn't work in slowing it down. But it's been tried. Um, I got this question um, recently. In terms of the community that has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, do you have an idea or an estimate of what the percentage of those folks have transitioned to managing with um, pharmaceutical techniques? Or in other words, what percentage are not managing or treating with uh, L-Vodopa, Carbidopa? I have no idea what the number is uh, with that. I will say that the vast majority of people are on it, even family practice docs that don't have any specialty in neurology, let alone subspecialty, uh, know how to write it because it has such a profound influence. Um, just to tell you, my the person who started the program here at UCLA, Charles Markham, was around in part of the early trials, and he did these studies which are still used today, which is, before levodopa was available, your life expectancy was about seven years after diagnosis. After levodopa, it's almost normal. It's that big of an effect. So I think, um, I thought you were gonna ask what percentage are seeing movement disorder specialists. And that's I like still, that too. <laughs> yeah, that's a small percentage. Um, nobody knows exactly, probably five to 10%. 
it was surprising to me that a large percentage don't even aren't even managed by a neurologist. They're managed by generalists. And um, there's a we've done some studies. Eric Chang here at UCLA did some really important studies showing how much of a difference it makes in the quality of people's life with Parkinson's if you're treated with as a specialist. Neurologists did better, but not as good. And general people really lacked a lot of the expertise, especially the non-motor symptoms, the problems with constipation, blood pressure problems, depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, cognitive problems, all of those things other than tremors and stiffness, that's where the uh, non-specialists are, are failing. Wow. Well, I'm going to try to squeeze one more question in here. What about administering L-DOPA through the nose with a puffer? So we have one out there through the lungs called Embresia, where you can inhale and that helps. It gets in there, but it uh, doesn't stay very long. So it's called a rescue therapy. So if people are off and it takes a long time for their pills to work, you can uh, inhale it. It's, it looks a lot like um, you know an asthma inhaler. Um, through the nose probably won't get enough to the place where you want it to go. Um, so I don't think through the nose is going to work, but the inhaled versions in Brescia can, um, can be helpful. Um, it's not good. You can't get the carby dopa in that way. So it's not good as a mainstay. People cough a lot with it and it doesn't stay in your blood very long. So it's good for a short term, but not good for a mainstay. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Bronstein, for your time today. Uh, again, we really appreciate it. We have some upcoming events that we'd like to tell you about, and they're great. Join us next month to learn about aging and Parkinson's, as well as how to navigate hospitalization when living with Parkinson's. Links to register for these events, as well as updates for all of our programs will be sent out to our email list. Uh, today was made possible by our sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kieran, and Supernus, and by you. By donating to PCLA, you can help us join in our mission to improve the lives of families in our community who are living with Parkinson's. Your donation will help us continue providing programs like today's event for free. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. And as always, we're here for you. Reach out to us with questions at info at PCLA.org, or you can also always ring us at 310-880-3143. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bronstein. Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Take care, everyone. Have a great summer.